Good morning. Good morning. I give him a heads up. <laughs> they say I'm loud. I don't believe it. And awesome. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries today? Guarantee that those are the times. 
times, especially Friday, because Friday is when they renew movies. So we think it's going to be the 6th at 7, which is sold out, then 10 o'clock, which is still open, and then the next day, Friday, uh, 7 and 10 again, but not for sure. Yeah. And the ticket prices are $11.25 for adults, $7.75 for seniors, and $7.50 for children. It is a very good movie, but I understand 10 o'clock is awful late. Well, that sounds strange coming from me. <laughs> 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 Anyways, um, I, I actually want to uh, mention um, the election that's coming up. We, um, like I said, Valencia County is very, very important in this election with worldwide consequences. Women come from all over the world to Albuquerque to have an abortion. And um, our state legislature has uh, a member who lives in Valencia County. So that's why our vote is so critical. Now, if you've recently moved or you want to register or want to change your whatever, um, Arlie has the voter registration. Put your hand up and he'll bring you one. Anybody need to register to vote? All right, there's one. Good, because we want to see all of you at the poll. Thank you. All righty, do we have a children's sermon? Oh, Amanda? I have another announcement. Okay. Probably something I forgot. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, the youth and the singing angels are having a competition to see who can raise the most food for um, some gift boxes, some Thanksgiving gift boxes that will go to benefit Jean Nestor's church. So there are um, some boxes in the back as well as some suggestion forms, the paper with the ideas of what you can bring. Um, if you want to bring something, put it in the appropriate box either for the youth or for the singing angels. <laughs> you can do perishables like in yeah. October through mid November, that way it won't that way get it won't eaten spoil. Yes. And if you don't want to show favoritism, you can give two each. There you go. There you yeah. go. Show favoritism, give to each. You can That's what I have to do. I have to give to each because my kids are in the Singing Angels and I'm part of the youth. So. I'm not biased. So, anyways, if you would like to donate to that, please, there's lists in the back and we would love to have your help because they go for a very good cause to benefit people who don't have the food to actually get. Thanksgiving meals. Okay, here you go. I'll say this, but they're, they're out there in Meadow Lake, and they, things are hard for these people out there, so it does help them out a lot. Um, do we have a children's sermon today? No children's sermon. Okay, then we will pray, and we will continue with our worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the so many blessings you've given us and you've given this church. We ask that you just watch over us and teach us what you want us to teach. As you bless Casey in his sermon that you've given him, allow us to learn exactly what you want us to hear today. Grant us with your grace and your mercy, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh oh. Hey, there, there we go. I don't know if you're up. That woke me up. Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Is that better? I heard you. Did you get your mic turned on? Yeah. yeah. I was just listening to, to the worship team song, Amazing Grace. Amen. I, I, let me tell you a, a funny thing. Over a week ago, Kim and I went to a, a funeral. Um, the mother of a, of a good friend of ours from college uh, passed away, uh, a, a Hindu lady. And we're sitting at the funeral, which if you've, if you've never got to, to see a, a Hindu funeral service, it's an experience. It, it, I'm sure it, it's different from, from many of the, the things that you're used to. 
Um, men, for example, sit on one side of the room. Women sit on the other. Every butter, at least as, as many people that know about it, we, we didn't know about it, wore white. Did you know that white is a, a, a funeral color? Anyway, we, we went to this funeral, and we got to listen to prayers and, 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 and listen to some, some, some messages in, in Hindu that we didn't even know what was being said. But it made me wonder... And it started me thinking right after this service, how do we know that we are saved? How do, how do you get salvation? How, how do you guarantee that you are going to heaven? Right. And it made me start thinking, and I, I kind of got stuck on this word grace. And let me tell you a funny thing. Ted sends me an email every week saying, you know, these are the songs that, that we're going to be working on uh, on Sunday. And when I got that list, it was just amazing to me how Ted and his list of, of things that you all, you're already saying, how that list just blends itself in perfectly without, without my planning, without, without Ted's knowing of, of exactly what I was going to do. How they go together. God's got a plan. That's right. Amen. God's got a plan. And it just made me think. I, I came this morning to, to talk to you about grace. And, and going to that funeral really made me focus on the word grace. What does grace mean? I, I've heard lots of different definitions. And what did you just say? Unmerited favor. I've read that in lots of different places. Unmerited favor. Something you don't deserve. Something you don't deserve. Well, there's lots of things I don't deserve. <laughs> <laughs> the good things you don't deserve. Oh, the good things you don't deserve. I remember there was a, a librarian once that thought I didn't turn in the library book on time. I didn't deserve what she had ready for me. <laughs> <laughs> I know I turned that book in. So it's the good things. Well, it made me think, and, and when Ted gave me that list, he put on there Amazing Grace. And if you've listened to Chris Tomlin, Chris Tomlin sing that song that you were just doing. Chris Tomlin kind of, when I first heard it, I thought, oh my gosh, Chris Tomlin changed those words. And, and I was kind of like, how dare Chris Tomlin change those <laughs> words? Well, it turns out that Chris Tomlin really didn't. Did you know that Amazing Grace has many more verses to the song than what you're used to in your, your little Baptist hymnal or, or whatever book you've, you've used, your music book? There's many more verses to it than what at least what I was used to. And so when Chris Tomlin sings it, and, and Ted's lyrics today I notice have it, these extra verses are actually from John Newton. Have you ever heard of the story of John Newton? It, it's a famous Christian story. John Newton, born in 1725, born in Southampton, England, a, a big sailing uh, port. As a matter of fact, Southampton is, is where the, the pilgrims left England, where the where the Titanic left England, big port city. His father was a sailor, so he was gone often when little John Newton was growing up. And his mother prayed over him. She wanted him to become a minister. She taught him Bible verses. But when she, or when he was about seven years old, when he was just still a young boy, his mother died. She suddenly died. His father was gone on a, on a, a ship. And when his dad came back, he remarried almost immediately. And so he was living with his stepmother. And I hate to, to bring up Disney movies, but you know how those stepmother things sometimes don't work. <laughs> well, in John Newton's case, it didn't work. He left. He left home. He actually went with his father as an 11-year-old and started sailing with his dad. He got on those ships, and, and he was just a young seaman at the time, and kind of got trimmed up. And he learned all about sailing from his father. But when he was just about 17, he was pressed into service with the British Navy. And if you're not sure what pressed into service means, that means that they grabbed him off the street, basically kidnapped him, put him on a ship, and he became a midshipman in the British Navy. Hated it. Hated it. John Newton was not a big fan of people telling him what to do. He, he, he grew up a, on a lot of his time on his own. There are other people in here that are familiar with that. All right. 
not to name names or anything, Wayne, but I, I <laughs> But John Newton gets Shanghai, and that's what the, the word Shanghai means, is, is oppressed in service, kidnapped, brought onto ship to serve. And so first chance he gets, he deserts. He leaves. He, he tries to run away. Well, British, uh, British officers find him. They beat him. That's not the thing to do. You don't run away from the Navy. They beat him, put him back into service, and he's such a horrible influence. He cusses, and, and the funny thing is, is, is he even talks about himself, and, and the other men that sailed with him talked about him being the worst mouth sailor. Imagine that, the worst mouth sailor they had ever seen. And so he just became kind of this toxic guy that nobody wanted to be around, so, the, so he talked the Navy into releasing him to go with, of all things, the captain of a slave ship. Now, this is the 1700s. The British would take captured Africans, put them on ships, chain them up, sail them to America, and they would be sold into slavery. Well, he started working as a midshipman on this ship, and in an amazing thing happens, and I'm kind of trying not to steal his words here. He does an amazing thing of, of telling him about his story. But he was on a ship in the middle of a storm just off of the Irish coast, and this storm was sinking the ship. The ship was taking in water. The captain was on deck, and he called for all hands to, to come on deck. He climbed, John Newton climbs the ladder, getting up onto deck. The man climbing the ladder above him, just as he gets to the deck, is washed overboard with a huge wave that, that swamps the deck. Newton arrives up on the deck, middle of a storm, by the way, middle of the night, and the captain asks him to run the, the wheel. So he gets to steer this ship, and he has to tie himself down so he's not thrown over the ship. He starts to remember all those times that his mother, as he was just a little kid, prayed over him. The scripture that he heard comes back to him. And he prays out to God in the midst of this 11-hour storm. The ship was tossed and turned, almost flooded for 11 hours. He prays to God to save him. And he promises, you know, how, how, some, of those, how, how some of those prayers go. If you just save me, God, I will. Well, he promises that he will become a minister. Well, 11 hours, storm goes away. Newton and the, the ship are, are safe. And he continues until he gets to port. Takes another th two or three weeks to get to port because the ship had been so battered off coast. By the time he gets back, that promise, I hate to say it, is, is kind of fading. He, he had a conversion on the ship, but it wasn't followed through. And so he becomes eventually a captain of his own slave running ship. He becomes captain and takes people from Africa to America. Horrible, horrible conditions. People in chains, no running water, people not being fed. Horrible conditions. And Newton, of all people, is in charge of this situation. Many times over, not just once, many, many trips. God starts chipping away at John Newton. He was only captain for a few years until finally God started working on him and he knew that he had to, to leave. He started to just feel guilty, a, a heavy heart. So he leaves the ship, leaves that whole career behind, and he tries being a clerk uh, in the port. Uh, clerk for these shipping crews. And that's just not what God had him had in store for him either. John Newton gets a call to become a pastor. He tries, a, a, well, he, he doesn't go to seminary. He tries self-teaching himself scripture. He learns Greek and Hebrew on his own. That, that's got to be a huge accomplishment, learning two other languages by himself. And eventually he gets a chance. <laughs> The church that he gets, though, is a small, out-of-the-way, little tiny church in Olney, which is part of England. But he gets a neighbor. William K. 
Cowper is his neighbor and only. And, and I was telling you about William Cowper last week. When we were talking about the, the verses that I had up on the screen, and I asked you if they were verses that are, are really in the Bible or not. God works in mysterious ways. It's an actual song. It, the song was written by William Cowper, who actually was John Newton's neighbor. God put these two men together, and the two men write every week, every week, a brand new hymn. At this time, in the, the 1700s, mid-1700s, hymns were not the, the songs that you're used to. Hymns, are, hymns were not even welcome in church. People thought it was sacrilegious to sing hymns in church. The Church of England outlawed hymn singing. Totally. Couldn't have a hymn in church. But these two men are out in a, a small town, little tiny church, off on their own. So they write hymns. Every week they sing hymns. In 1779, for New Year's service, that New Year's service, John Newton writes Amazing Grace. Well, it wasn't even called Amazing Grace when he wrote it. Uh, and it wasn't a song that you're familiar with. The, the actual tune came much later. The tune is actually an American tune that came oh, about 50 or so years after Newton wrote the song. But he wrote it, and people think that maybe that first service that, that he went to his church on that New Year's Day, 1779, was just recited. It was just read aloud, not actually sung. It may have been to a tune. We don't know. Nobody recorded what the, the tune could have been if there was one. But only hymns becomes a very popular book. Cowper and Newton combine all the hymns that they wrote while they lived together in this little town. And they published it. It is by far the most popular hymnal ever written. Only hymns. Amazing Grace becomes the number one hymn sung more times than any other hymn. And it came from this man who had a horrible start in life. With his mother dying, with his father kind of leaving him to be on his own and, and running away and... and and actually the career that he took in, in carrying slaves on ship, God kept working at it little by little until he finally actually got to be the pastor that his, his mom, in, she envisioned for him. She saw that that's what he would be. Well, he gets a second pastorate in London itself. Not, a, not any little town anymore. He gets to go to London itself. And one of the congregants in his church is a man by the name of William Wilberforce. Newton tells Wilberforce his life story. He tells him about his, his mother. He tells him about his father. He tells him about the slaves that he carried across the ocean. Wilberforce listens to Newton and takes everything that Newton tells him, all the horrors of those ships, the, the suffering that those people went through, and Wilberforce is a member of parliament. He's a British member of parliament. So for 20 years after talking to Newton, after Newton got to, to move to London, Wilberforce every year introduces the same law over and over and over again in the British parliament. He's rejected. People don't vote for him. People think he's silly to even keep trying. But his law was to ban the slave trade in not just Britain, not the islands, but all of the British Empire. For 20 years, William Wilberforce works at, at getting this law passed. Finally, after 20 years, the British Parliament passes this law, and for half of the world, the British, the British Empire was covering all around the globe at this point. The law banned the slave trade. And about 20 years after that, Britain actually passed a law that, that prohibited, prohibited slavery of any kind in their empire. And it all goes back to William Wilberforce. It all goes back to John Newton. And it all goes back to his mother praying for him when he was just a little baby boy, when he's just a little boy. You think God's got plans? You think God's got plans where, where, where we are right now and, and to take us forward from there? We don't get to see God's plans. We don't get to always see how they work out. But we have faith that God's got plans. And it makes me think, as I was, I, I had talked about that story a couple of years ago when, when Barry and I were, were doing a song service. But man, when 
I saw Ted's list this week on his email, it really made me think about, I want to know more about John Newton and more about how that all came about with Amazing Grace, the song. But it made me think of grace. If what you're saying is that grace is unmerited favor, if it's, if it's good things that you don't deserve, do you think Newton spoke from experience there? Did he deserve to be rescued from this storm? Did he deserve God to, to build him up, to, to get him into this career that his mother foresaw and knew all along that he was going to be a part of? Did Newton even deserve to be, I hate to say this, did Newton deserve to be saved, to be a child of God, to, to enter into heaven? Did he deserve that? I don't think he did. And honestly, do any of us. I may not be a, a captain of a slave ship. I, I may not be in charge of, of beating people or chaining people. I doubt that any of us are in that capacity. But do any of us deserve what God's plans are for us? Well, that's that idea of grace. If you've got your Bible with you today, I want you to look at Ephesians. And we've had some problems with our with our projection system. I, I think you noticed it with our songs. We had some problems with our, our sound system this morning. Let's see how well things work for me this today. Let's see if God's grace is sufficient for me. <laughs> so far. So far. In Ephesians, this is Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, and he says something that I think goes with what Newton was experiencing. In Ephesians, Paul writes, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. That very first sentence talks about grace. God saved you by his grace when you believed. So what is grace? If Anne's right, it's unmerited favor. God's sacrifice for us. Jesus went up on that cross. His blood was shed for us. Did we deserve that? Did we earn that somehow? Did, do we get to earn our place in heaven? Is basically the bottom line. I think that's what I was thinking about at that funeral that I went to. Is do we earn our place in heaven? Is there some way that... Oh, here's one I was talking about last week. I was talking about reading your Bible. If you read your Bible every day, do you get an RSVP to heaven? Do you got your, your seat reserved for you just because you're reading your Bible? Okay. Um, ooh. Every morning I go out for a walk. While I'm, I'm taking my walk, I pray about whatever things are, are going to happen that day, whatever things are going on, or, or whatever emails you all are, are, are sharing around, and, and the ladies are, are sharing emails about prayer requests. Is there a place saved in heaven if we pray every morning? Is there a place in heaven if you show up here on Sunday, you come in at 11 o'clock? Arlie, is there a place saved for us that way? There's a tithing box. Surely God's got to look favorably on us if, if we're tithing. Maybe if we tithe, we get our place in heaven. Is that it? Then what in the world do we do? What about Jesus? Do, do, we, do we somehow earn something? Do we work at it? Do we, do we do something to earn that place with Jesus? Can we ever be good enough? Admit our sins. Look at it. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hate to say it, but I'm good at that boasting thing. <laughs> Man, I remember when, when I was young, my mom and dad were bowlers. Any of you bowlers in here? Go to the bowling alley, go to the sugar bowl. You can't even do that anymore. Go to the sugar bowl. Saturday mornings, kids would bowl, I'm going to brag. See, I told you I'm good at that. I was the number one bowler for, for a long time. But man, I had a problem. I wanted people to know that I was the best one then, not just to be the best one. It, wasn't, it was not good enough to be the best. It was better if everyone knew it. That's not... You understand how I'm feeling? Then, 
That's not what God wants for us. The young Casey was way more interested in getting everybody's attention than just going about there and having fun and doing my business of, of, of playing this game. And I think that what Paul's writing about is that if we could do something to earn our way into heaven, if we could read our Bible more, like I talked about last week, or if we could pray more, or you know what? Abraham was in the hospital a few weeks ago. If we could just go and visit those in the hospital and you know, bring food to those that are mourning, if we could just do something, then we earn our way into heaven. According to Paul, if we did that, would our salvation be dependent on Jesus or dependent on us? It would be on our works. And then what would the standard be? That's what made me start thinking at this funeral that I went to, is what is our standard for getting into heaven? If it's not what we do, if, if we can't earn our way into heaven, we can't pray enough to get to heaven, we can't give enough, we can't help enough, we can't do any of those things enough to get to heaven. If all we have is our faith, that's a great system. Because I hate to say it, but as much as maybe I'd want to be in heaven, what's the standard that I would meet? At what criteria, what level do I help, 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 pray, pray, pray? Ooh, now I'm in. <laughs> oh, sorry, God. You already let me in. I'm done for the year. I'm going home now. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to... Watch TV for a while. I'm done helping. I'm done praying. I'm done giving. That's what humans would do. I think that's what people would do. We would work, 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 work until we met whatever standard it was. And then we'd give up. We'd kind of slack off. Have you ever heard of senioritis? <laughs> Those 17 year old kids, they work, work, work for 11 years. You know, they're going to school, they're going to school. Ooh, that light at the end of the tunnel's right there. You know, I could sleep in a little today. I don't need to actually study for that test. I already got my, my diploma ready to go. We're kind of that way. It's a human nature thing. When we think we've done enough, we've done enough. But that's not the way God's got this system set up. God's system is His sacrifice, Jesus' blood, and all we have to do is have faith and trust in Him. Amen. That's it. Right. And... and it's hard for us. It's hard to say, I want to be responsible. I want to work at something. I want to, I want to be a part of that. It's hard for humans to, to not work at something. We want, to, we want some responsibility in that. Well, the only responsibility that we have is to just trust in God's plan and trust in His sacrifice, trust in that blood, and we're in that. Amen. That's it. I was sitting at that funeral and it made me think, what do they believe? This is a Hindu funeral that we went to. Like I said, all the men on one side, women on one side, everybody wearing white, a lot of, a lot of prayers that have no idea what, was, what the words were. So it made me think, as soon as I got home, I'm like, ooh, gotta Google this. This is a thing to go look up stuff. What do they believe? How do you get to heaven? Is there any other name than Jesus to give it down? I was telling you last week about statistics. I'm a math guy. I love math. Taught math for a long, long time. And numbers help me understand the world. Did you know that nearly 90% of Americans, it's usually sometimes a little above, sometimes a little above, but let's round off say 90% of Americans believe in God. Does that sound familiar to you? Most of the people you know could say, yes, there is a God. But of those people that actually believe in God, did you know that only about two-thirds of those, not two-thirds of everybody, just two-thirds of the people that believe in God, believe in Jesus, that Jesus actually truly existed, that there was an actual historical man named Jesus that lived in Israel in the first century AD. Only about two-thirds. You start talking to those people, and the, the percent gets incredibly small from there of the people that believe that Jesus is actually the Messiah, the, the promised Savior. 
It's incredibly small. And it made me think at that funeral that Jesus is the only one that can save us. All we need to do is have that faith. But we need to not get confused and think that there are other things out there that can save us. It's not our works, like Paul was talking about. It's not these other beliefs. Lifeway Research, talking about statistics, Lifeway Research um, does a statistical survey every year. They ask people, how do you get to heaven? And Paul just writes up there, salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. So they ask the people a question. How many of you believe that you can work, have something to do with getting into heaven? And they ask Christians this. They, they've narrowed their, their population down. This isn't just 100% of their survey takers. It's just Christians and people that identify as Christians. They ask them, how do you get into heaven? About, it's about two-thirds of them believe that somehow we can work our way into heaven. It's the prayer. It's the tithing. It's the attendance coming to church. Two-thirds of people in Christian churches, these are Christians, believe that they can somehow affect their salvation by works, by what they do. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what Paul is saying right here. That's not what Jesus came for. Do you think Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross that his blood was shed so that we should go and tithe now? So that we should go and, and, and you know, attend church every week? No. Our job is to recognize Jesus' sacrifice, accept that, and we are saved. That's it. It's plain and simple. That's all there is to it. Don't add anything else. That's right. God makes, God makes this world at times too simple for us. It's people that add all the extra stuff. That's right. God simply says, accept my sacrifice, accept my son, and you're all good to go. I'll see you later when you get here. You know, that's it. Now, there's a whole lot of uh, things that God wants us to do in the meantime while we're still living in this world. But none of those things that we are to do have anything to do with are we saved or not. That's right. The only thing that has to do with that is being saved because you accepted Jesus' the sacrifice. You recognize it. That is it. So last week when I was talking to you about reading your Bible, please don't go home and think that, oh my gosh, Casey says we need to be reading our Bible. Let's pull out our Bible so we can go to heaven. That's not the way it works. That Bible is so that you can actually learn more about the God who sacrificed himself for you. Amen. That Bible is there so you can learn about how you should be living your life while you're here, waiting for that day that you actually get to be with God in heaven. But it is not going to get you there on its own. You cannot do it. So I'm just, I, I want to clarify that. When I, when I read some stats after coming back from that funeral, it made me worried about you all. It's like, no, no, don't, don't start thinking that that's the way to go. We don't have any of those two-thirds of people in here, do we? No, Because I'm telling you, Paul writes, it's not a reward. You've got to know that difference. When it comes time for all of us, when it comes time for our funeral, when it's our turn, pastor, speaker, family, whoever it is, is going to stand up on a, a stage, stand up on a podium, stand in front of a casket. We're all going to be in that position. That's right, John. They may have family that remembers and says, you know, they worked every week helping the poor. They went to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, Went to church every day, those doors were open. They prayed every day, every morning. Got up first thing, before the sun even rose, prayed. <clears throat> you can have family that, that says all those great things. If you have not 
given your life to Jesus. If you have not accepted that that sacrifice is for you, and all you've got to do is recognize it, that's right. mm -hmm. then everything is for nothing. It's wasted. That's a sad thing. I came out of that funeral, and I kept thinking, this is a sad thing. It's kind of a waste. Not the funeral, not the, the, the hour and a half that we sat with that entire life. And I don't want that for you all. Right. Right. You know? Uh, that worries me. Don't, don't, don't get caught up in, in thinking that you work your way into heaven. Don't get caught up in, in I, I'm saved because my, my mom was a Christian or my, my dad prayed for me. No. Your, your place in heaven has nothing to do with, with your family praying you into heaven or, or doing things for you. It's just you and a decision. That's all it is. That's it. Ted, could you bring your worship team up? If you have not actually made